There is an African world view that transcends borders, cultures, and generations. In South Africa, we call it Ubuntu. Umtungu umtunga A person is a person through other persons. I am because you are. During the struggle for the liberation of South Africa from apartheid and colonialism, South Africans experience international solidarity from many corners of the world. This is the story of the spirit of Ubuntu, crossing borders from Finland. International solidarity is one of the oldest practices in helping other um, nations or people from moving towards the emancipation. You would find that um, where there would be um, issues within nation states or between nation states, even issues on women emancipation. If it wasn't for solidarity, many would not have received their freedom and um, many would not have um, realized um, the purpose within society. When I was a young boy, uh, I was a school boy in the 1960s, uh, we organized at schools a uh, solidarity campaign, fundraising for school children in Mozambique. That was a starting for, from many of us that there is a problem in Southern Africa. What is Mozambique? Later on, obviously, Namibia came up, Swapo struggle there, Angola, MPLA. And the root of the problem, sorry to say, the root of the problem wasn't in Portugal necessarily, very much in South Africa. And, and, and we started to discuss more and more about the Southern African problems. And we created ourselves solidarity movements early 1970s around Southern African problems. We got obviously information quite a lot via obviously liberation movements because we had office of ANC here in Helsinki, we had office of SWAPO, so, so we obviously contacted those uh, liberation movements in, in, in Southern Africa. These were giving different picture of the reality of the countries than the overall mass media was giving. It's still so that Western mass media didn't explore, didn't open it properly what apartheid society really means. What it really means, obviously, if there were war situations, fightings, etc., those were news, but didn't analyze deeply what is in behind, why there are problems and what is the situation. So, so obviously, the solidarity movements, our task was not only to campaign for solidarity work, but they spread information. And we tried to publish the material. And this actually is this book, Rotu Sorron Kahalessa, in the chain of racial discrimination, that was an idea to summarize what is actually happening in Southern Africa. The National Anti-Apartheid Committee was established, I think, in 1965, uh, which was a more broader, the trade unions uh, joined the students and some other organizations. Uh, not only left-wing organizations, there was also liberal organizations. The conservatives were rather, rather suspicious of, of that at that time still. It changed later. I became the secret secretary of the f first uh, national committee and the chairman was a very colorful person, very well known in Finland. He was a trade unionist, a syndicalist, which was quite unusual at that time. Mr. Uh, Valeri, Nilo Valeri, he was the, the president and chairman of the Sailors Union and also uh, in a larger context, the Transport Workers Union. Syndicalist means that he had been uh, living in the United States and there picked up this idea that uh, the trade unions are not only you know, fighting for labor rights and, and, and salaries, they are also fighting for a better society in general and they had an international leaning, he spoke good English. And so he was a very powerful leader, 
when he said, if you don't stop trading with the South Africa now, I will stop all ships coming, you know, I will stop the export. And that was a very powerful weapon because uh, the, the sailors and the cargo people, they, they obeyed him. We go on strike tomorrow if you dare not follow his advice. These uh, campaigns somehow got more strength after the uh, Union of Transport Workers uh, launched boycott. They made a decision not to let anything go through Finnish harbors to South Africa or to come uh, in. So uh, mainly from the media, but especially because my father and my mother were very active in uh, trade union movement. So they were, my mother was a shop steward. So, so we learned via that, they told that we should boycott the South African products because uh, not all people are equal there. And then I learned to know this. And uh, I always remember that my daddy always said, it's so pity they could have so good brandy in South Africa, but I can't drink it. And, and so that was very typical that, that we have had between our countries already the trade contacts and so. But because of this political will to try to change the system more democratic, so a lot of people boycotting South African products. But of course, we didn't know everything in, in, in uh, separated issues, but more or less we knew that uh, it was a racism, it was an apartheid. For our, the movement here was directly a solidarity movement, which is a difference because anti-apartheid, it's against apartheid, but we were for something. We were for the struggle of the liberation movement, and that was immediately like that. So we were not just looking at that bad apartheid, but yes, we must support the people who are struggling in, in Africa. Uh, and for me, let's say it came like that, that at that time, we had a very short time, we had a, we had a South Africa committee. I started by campaigning against Shell. It was an easy, concrete way to do something, because there is, of course, little you can do about something which is unjust and happens on the other side of the world. But boycotting Shell, uh, or rather to say campaigning about boycotting Shell, Shell was, was something easy to, to pick up, and, and that's what we were doing. We went driving around the shells, the, the shell stations in town. And of course, some police then uh, started following us. So we, we, we printed a huge sticker, Nelson Mandela Street. And then uh, we had told some journalists that, come, we've got something to do. Um, you might be interested. And then we um, made a rendezvous to the park, which was situated um, opposite of South African Embassy. We had a car ready that we were going to escape. So then we just uh, we lifted one of our colleagues and he quickly, you know, blasted the, 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 the plastic tape in, on, on top of the, it was called Rahapajankat. So by the time we ended up there with our vans, with the police following us, um, it was already signed as Nelson Mandela Street. And we went to the park and, and had some champagne because of this nice new street name in Helsinki. Now, of course, the police came and we were all arrested. And it was Nelson Mandela, Mandela Street, maybe for half an hour, an hour, I don't remember. We were fighting for the struggle, we were supporting the struggle, but nobody had been there. We knew really nothing. And, and so I thought that, wow. And at that time, still, we were, we were the most radical organization, but still we were supported by the, by the Ministry of Education, not long after that, but, <laughs> but during that time, they still supported us. When we were in Lusaka, uh, we got so good contact, especially with Agostino Neto. And, and uh, 
so he invited us to their guerrilla camp and, and so we, we stayed there for some week and, and lived with Agostino Neto and uh, then after some days we thought we were sitting evenings with Agostino Neto, a very nice man, a very, very, like a professor. He was a very kind man. And I think we got very near friends. And then one evening we decided with my friend that, can we dare ask him that can we join the guerrillas and go into Angola? And, and we thought that, that, you know, he will laugh and say that, hey, you can't do that, you are not in that condition, but, but to our astonishment he said that he had thought for many days that would he dare to ask us could we go with the guerrillas in, because then we would be the first who could tell about the, the struggle, the guerrilla struggle. And at that time it was so strong propaganda war going on in West about the guerrillas and the guerrillas were called communists and they were called terrorists and they are killing everybody and they are just working for Russia and all this kind of stuff. And uh, <coughs> also we want to see, is it, is it true or not? Mm. We was building this uh, Moses Kotane uh, center there in Angola near uh, Luanda. It was Vienna, Vienna camp during that time we call it. And, and uh, it, uh, we make the I don't remember exactly how many buildings, but quite many buildings to the South African uh, refugees, mostly ANC refugees. But uh, of course, I, I don't know if somebody was or not member of ANC, but uh, I was there near three years. My uh, duty was uh, the, the electricity of the campsite and install stalling electricians electricity and uh, uh, also teaching uh, agency comrades to, to how to make those works oliver tambo was visiting in in uh, in the camp during that time finishing the, the first uh, phase of the, the project and he was uh, with his delegation, they, they, they go around there and he was also uh, making a speech to the comrades there and they had, had so big uh, heart. They was uh, thinking about uh, the whole world, not only one person. He really was a very a uh, great person uh, and, and uh, his way to talk and to, to meet other people were, was very unique. Um, he, he really had a ability to charm whoever was near him. In 1978 um, in Cuba there was a festival for was it now for, for youth and students or what is it called? But anyway, World Festival. And, um, uh, and um, suddenly, uh, Oliver Tambo just came to, to visit Finnish delegation where we were um, uh, accommodated. And uh, I happened to be the first one he <laughs> saw there. And uh, when I just realized that, oh my God, this is Mr. Tambo. Uh, and uh, I called uh, everyone to, to come to see him uh, uh, and uh, he, he just gave a speech very spontaneous way and, uh, and asked for the support of the support for, for ANC um, and because it was such a spontaneous visit by his side um, uh, I, I, I had to translate or be an uh, interpreter while there were also some uh, um, friends from Finland who couldn't understand English. And so uh, uh, I became, uh, oh, I had an opportunity to talk with him a little bit more. And then I uh, met him later on uh, in these um, uh, conferences which were promoting sanctions and, and supporting anti-apartheid movement. I traveled down through, through Africa uh, and I was in Lusaka for about 
I had been there already in the spring of 1988 trying to get interviews, but uh, was not very successful. It was a fairly sort of ad hoc enterprise behind the gate on Cha 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 Street, just off. It was difficult. There were no phones. There was no mobile phones. You, you always had to go there to see if you had a meeting. So I kept going back and forth and never got the meeting. But then in, in October 1988, I, I actually uh, got an interview with Tabo Mbeki. Uh, and uh, uh, he was absolutely charming. He was, he was brilliant. Uh, uh, and uh, I felt that if this is what the, the struggle is like, you know, they're, they're going to be doing well. I, I went to South Africa as a, my capacity as Secretary General of the International Red Cross and met Mr. Mandela. Nelson Mandela had just been freed from, from, from the prison. And I remember that very well, that, that meeting with him, uh, because his first words, can you tell me what there and that and that person? He visited me in that and that year. And then the, he continued the name after name and I had to, as well as I could, tell him about that person, what that person was doing now and what happened in his life, you know. Because he, he of course, memorized very well all the Red Cross visitors who had, during all these years, visited him in Robben Island and, and, and later on in, when he was moved to the mainland. Uh, so I went down to Cape Town and uh, I had been there for like two days. Uh, uh, and through these friends I've made, I got made new friends. And then there was this big rumor that, that Nelson Mandela is in Polsmore. Uh, he's been at the hospital, he's going to be released. And we just drove out there. Uh, and uh, well, there was all rumors, but Winnie had been there to see him. And, and it was sort of, and I was feeling that I'm in the middle of, of, of everything. Uh, the people I, I hang out with were, were young, mainly white activists who were part of the, the UDF, I, who I got to know. The feeling of being uh, at a big rally uh, with Desmond Tutu and Dalla Omar and everybody speaking at the University of the Western Cape and you had the mellow yellow vans of the police out, outside uh, and the singing, uh, uh, the sort of singing of Nkosi Sikeleli Africa and, and, and these young people who had just come out from detention, you know, saying how they were continuing to fight. As I, as I said, I, I, I absolutely fell in, in love uh, with the struggle. And, and from there on, it was clear that the only thing that really interested me as a journalist was to, to document, follow and, and show uh, people in Finland what was happening, to, to sort of maybe even to say to be the voice of the struggle in, in, in Finnish media. Uh, I, I was uh, fairly partisan in, in my political view. I don't think that showed in my stories. I think it showed in the subjects and the, the sort of people I wanted to interview. This uh, meeting with uh, Nelson Mandela when he came to, to Europe to thank um, us for the work we had done is one of the most impressive times I ever had. And the second time, was I suppose when uh, when we uh, were there observing uh, observing the elections, the first elections, we woke up at the four at four o'clock in the morning when the roosters were <laughs> shouting, and, and it was amazing to see the the long long queues to the voting um, um, locations and uh, see people to be dressed to their best and and it was very sacred atmosphere actually otherwise it's i think that in south africa there is a lot of uh, colors and noise and whatever but uh, it was very um, uh, special atmosphere in that morning uh, it was it was very spiritual one actually i have been um, i have been quite great first time personally visiting in in uh, South Africa, but uh, then I've been several times and when I said that I know also the difficulties afterwards because uh, if you have had an undemocratic system so uh, it takes time before you you can see the different trees of the democratic system to grow and how you keep them all the time together and that's why I have not at all a romantic picture 
about the fast uh, uh, movements in, in the undemocratic system. I know that it takes time uh, to create an, not only the political system, but the good governance and the um, rule of law and all that. Uh, but uh, now I have had an opportunity to see um, see during the years this, and I think that uh, after the first very happy moments of the new freedom, you will also meet the hard work of every day. Some persons play a really important role. They can change things and societies. Uh, he was a, a figure, he was a leader, he was a, a speaker, he was a visioner. I was, by the time working in the ASE office, my boss said, now, Madipa, I want you to meet Birio, who's been working all the time when we've been having fun and meeting people. And I was trying to shake his hand, and he hugged me, saying that, uh, you are the kind of people we need. And I was like, ah, oh. <laughs> Thing is that we learned, we were on the receiving side. This was, the, this, this struggle for my life. It made me what I am. It's very much thanks to the fact that we were allowed to be with you. These uh, heroes, they are the great men. But we forgot that uh, in all countries you have needed also women. And I always underline the fact that African women are very strong women. And they are very capable to work. But that's why you should give also, in the most of the countries, more freedom, more power, more respect. But the solidarity word is more than, uh, than an active support in a crisis situation. For me, solidarity means much more those that we understand we are brothers across the borders. We are not only creating welfare societies and we are solidar within our own society, but the solidarity means also that you take care of the whole world in, in, and, and try development cooperation is one of the issues proper responsibility on several issues. And I would say so that, strange enough, uh, in Europe today there might be even more need for international solidarity works than in 1960s, 70s, 80s. I mean, if we really want to be global, we have to be global in the sense that we share the welfare. That we don't try to sort of, again, say, okay, fine, we give you development aid, yeah, and you have to, now you're on your own, African economy is growing, deal with it, yeah. But it's our companies that are robbing still the poor countries, and they are robbing us too. So yes, solidarity works have a different meaning today than, than, than maybe in, in 40 years ago, but yes, that's needed. Ubuntu, I am because you are. 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 Minä olen, koska sinä olet. I am because you are. I am because you are. Ja är eftersom du är. I am because you are. I am because you are. I am because you are.